Hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. And we're happy today to welcome back to the Westminster Institute, Dr. Stephen Bryan, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy. He's a leading expert in security, security strategy and technology. He's held senior positions in the Department of Defense on Capitol Hill and is president of a large multinational defense and technology company. He served as a senior staff director at the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee as head of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs and as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Trade, Security Policy, and as Founder and Director of the Defense Technology Security Administration. He's the author of Technology, Security, and National Power, Winners and Losers, and of three volumes of essays in Technology, Security, and Strategy. Dr. Bryan was twice awarded the highest acknowledgement from the U.S. Department of Defense receiving the Distinguished Service Medal. Today he's going to discuss with us Russia and Ukraine, what's next. Welcome back, Steve. Thank you very much for having me back. Uh, the Ukraine thing is, is a really huge problem, a very dangerous problem, and it's impossible to say how it's going to work out. Uh, as you know, the, the, the Russians have their point of view, NATO and the United States has its point of view, and I would add that the Europeans have their point of view. They're not all the same at all. And particularly, there's a division between what some of the Western European countries see, especially the Germans, but not only, the French as well, and what the U.S. is saying. So we have lots of disconnects and a lot of activity going on, some of it very harsh, some of the statements made by our president here in the United States, by the leader of NATO, uh, and by the Russians, by Mr. Putin, Mr. Mr. Lavrov, the harsh statements back and forth, the constant kind of uh, chatter that doesn't seem to want to sort itself out yet. The hopeful sign, if there is a hopeful sign, are two. Uh, the first is that uh, coming up soon will be another meeting in uh, Berlin of what's called the Normandy Group. Uh, the Normandy Group was set up in, in 2014 uh, on the margins of the uh, anniversary of the Normandy invasion where the heads of state were all there uh, with a decision to, to the Russians, the Germans, the French, the United States, and Ukrainians. The decision was that they would meet from time to time to try and sort out uh, the issue of uh, troubling Ukraine at that time. Uh, and they've met at various points along the way. There was a meeting last week uh, in Paris that seemed to make a little bit of progress, not enough. And the meeting, I think, in Germany that will take place soon it may be the critical one. That is to say, if, if there's going to be a solution through that channel, that's when it might be found. So you have to ask, what are the, what are the issues? And that's not so simple. It's not a clear-cut single issue. There's at least uh, three major issues. The first has to do with the eastern part, the, the southeastern part of, of Ukraine, which is the Donbass region, where you have uh, now two uh, ostensibly two republics, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic, which are breakaway provinces of Ukraine. That's one issue. And, and of course, everyone knows that the Russians have been supplying uh, those, the, the armies of, of those two republics, if we can call them that, uh, with armaments, uh, with intelligence, and with all kinds of other support. The second issue is Crimea, which is still not off the books, even though Russia has annexed Crimea, says it's not going to change its mind about that, that it belongs to them, uh, that it's been incorporated into Russia. End of story from their point of view, but from the Ukrainian point of view, it's their land. 
So they're demanding it back, and that's the second issue. And the third issue is, is the question of NATO's involvement in Ukraine. And will Ukraine become a member of NATO as part of NATO's expansion? It's the expansion of NATO that probably is the most uh, troubling issue for the Russians, in the sense that uh, the Russians have always had a kind of xenophobic and paranoid view of, of the West, uh, and they see themselves being surrounded. And, and so they regard Ukraine, if Ukraine became part of NATO, that then their southern flank would be uh, occupied by NATO, the eastern flank, or western for them, flank would be NATO, and they would have a serious uh, military, uh, and strategic, and security problem. That's what they say. I think they believe that, so there's no point in trying to dissuade them from that view. Um, so you have this question of NATO. The NATO position is uh, we have an open door. We can expand anyone who wants to join. If they meet our requirements, should be allowed to join NATO. NATO expansion is by itself a, a peculiar thing because the more you enlarge the alliance, the more difficult it is to defend the alliance. That's just a simple military uh, fact. And indeed, when the, the last parts of NATO were expanded in Eastern Europe, it was very clear that the Eastern Europeans and NATO itself lacked the capability to really have a, a proper defense if, in fact, some conflict broke out. And NATO has been working on this with quick reaction forces, and with de uh, rapid deployments, with movement of equipment, with training, with trying to upgrade the, uh, the Baltic states and the Central Europeans uh, with better army equipment, uh, better aircraft, better tanks, all of that. All, uh, but most importantly of all, missile defenses, because the Russians have a, a very formidable missile capability. So all of that is part of a package of, of uh, things that, that NATO has been doing to try and strengthen security in that part of the, of the world. Um, the difficulty is, is that NATO deploys very few numbers of troops. President Biden has said that he's going to send 3,000 troops, mostly to Poland, trying to strengthen uh, the flank of, of NATO with U.S. troops. But actually, there's only about 5,000 available soldiers throughout NATO that, that can be sent into Eastern Europe if needed. That's very, very, very few, given the size of, of Russian forces. I mean, it, in fact, if you look at just around Ukraine, the Russians have already put 107,000 troops. And that number will continue to grow, I think. And they have also moved uh, Russian army forces, air force assets, too into Belarus, which is, also has a long border with Ukraine. And it's a corridor that could be used for an attack on Ukraine. So if NATO really is serious about wanting to have Ukraine as a member state, it has to figure out how it could defend it if it needed to. And I don't think it can figure that out. There's no practical way today to, to do that. Worse than that, if you look at, at the map and you, and you think about uh, what could happen in a conflict, if for the, for the NATO forces to operate, even in Ukraine, they're going to need bases in Eastern Europe. So you can't just isolate a military operation to Ukraine because those bases become suppliers and supporters of a military effort. The Russians know that, and they will target those bases for sure if a conflict broke out. So it's not a simple proposition that can be, you, you can't just f fight a selected battle if you wanted to. Uh, you, you, it's not possible because I think that all these places from Estonia and Latvia, Lithuania, down to Poland, and then to Bulgaria and Hungary, or Hungary and Bulgaria and Romania, that all these places are technically could be in, in, in the line of fire. And I think they're starting to realize that that's exactly the case. And that's why there's a division emerging in Europe. The Poles have started to make offers to the Russians. The Bulgarians have said, well, we don't really want to be involved in this. Maybe we can work out something with you Russians. Let's talk about it. 
the uh, president of uh, Hungary, Orban, was just in Moscow talking with uh, President Putin, uh, not only about natural gas deliveries, which Putin promised, but also about security and stability in the area. Clearly, Hungary does not want to be part of any military operation that might develop. So it isn't clear to me, either from the point of view of NATO or even from the point of view of Ukraine, that being a, a member of NATO is necessarily a good thing because it could precipitate rather than not precipitate a conflict. And the Russians have said that, that the fact of Ukrainian NATO membership for them is a red line. And I think they're saying that if it, that happened, they would be obliged to try and push NATO out of Ukraine. So that's sort of the on the ground problem as we see it right now. There's a lack of trust, absolute lack of trust between the Russians and, and the United States and Russians and NATO. As you might know, the, the, the Russians had been part of the NATO family on a contingent basis and they had been, uh, they had an office in Brussels and they were generally meeting with, with NATO counterparts, although that started to break down about a year ago. And uh, about uh, three months ago, the, uh, the uh, NATO people said the Russians needed to, to leave, except for maybe a, one or two that could remain. The Russians said, that's okay, we're leaving altogether. And on top of that, they kicked the NATO representation that was in Moscow out of the country. So that's become a, p a point of tension between NATO and, the, and Russia that wasn't so much before. Uh, most of the arms agreements that had been in place, the, the tactical ones, have broken down. They're, they're not really operating right now. So the lack of trust spreads to that area as well. Uh, there's less and less transparency between Russian military exercises and NATO military exercises that used to be, that was improved on starting around 2011 or so, but now that's gone away. So we have a very harsh situation when it comes to, when it comes to uh, relationships between Russia and let's say NATO and the United States. That's, that's one dimension of it. It's a very serious dimension of it because it makes it very difficult to know how uh, one can move forward with those kinds of tensions which have become deeper and deeper and deeper. Now there's another factor that we have to take into account from the Russian point of view. The Russians say that NATO has been arming Ukraine. NATO has been sending trainers and advisors to Ukraine. It has been shipping armaments of all kinds to Ukraine. And this didn't just happen yesterday, but it's been going on for a number of years and the Russians have been very aware, very aware of it and, and very unhappy about it. Almost to the point where the only thing missing is a NATO base in Ukraine and NATO membership, of course, for Ukraine. But everything else is almost already in place. And, and the U.S. has been a major, uh, from the Russian point of view, a major provocateur in, in trying to build up Ukraine so that it could fight off a, a, Russian, a, a Russian attack if one occurred. So let's look at it again from the point of view of the Russians. What should the Russians actually do? I mean, they've put down a challenge about NATO. They have massed troops for some time now on the Ukrainian border. Um, they have been demanding that the Ukrainians negotiate uh, according to what's called the Minsk agreements or the Minsk protocols. These were, the Minsk protocols were put together in 2014 and again in 2015, a second version of it. Aside from requiring a ceasefire, the, the biggest item on the, on the list is that they require that Ukraine uh, grant a form of autonomy to the two republics that I mentioned before, that they would be still under Ukrainian law, but they would be rather independent, and they would also have parliamentary representation in Ukraine. Uh, this the Ukrainians can't do politically at the moment, uh, and they've been resisting that, uh, negotiating on that subject for some time now. Which leaves 
things in great suspension. And this has been, you know, the fighting in Ukraine started around 2015, actually 2014. It, it was very intense for a while. The Ukrainians were finally unable to, to have a victory to, to take back these territories. Uh, so it's been a stalemate. There's been occasional fighting uh, along the line of uh, demarcation between the sides. Um, it breaks out, it stops, it breaks out again. It's supposed to be supervised by the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, but they really can't stop it if someone starts shooting. And they've been shooting from time to time. There's been a lot of casualties. So here are the Russians. They don't, the Russians do not recognize these two republics legalistically. That is to say, they have not granted them uh, any recognition because the Russians say, and I think they're correct, this should be negotiated under the Minsk Protocols. Uh, that was the agreement in 2014, again in 2015. Uh, Mr. Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, says yes, that the uh, Minsk Protocols are still part of the dialogue, but he hasn't committed to negotiate the prime issues that are part of, of that dialogue. So we're in a stalemate, but the stalemate is being leveraged by the Russian troops on the one side and by the pressure that NATO is building up inside of Ukraine on the other, and the other pressure that NATO's trying to build up, even though I don't think very successfully, uh, in Eastern Europe to show the Russians we mean business. The language has become harsh, harsh on all sides. So it's hard to see how you bridge this gap and, and where we go from here. Uh, it's clear that the current situation can't hold for much longer. Uh, I don't think the Russians will tolerate it for much longer. I don't think we will either. I don't think NATO will either. Uh, something has got to give. And as I said before, the, the best chance, at least in my estimation, may be uh, the Normandy Group meeting and coming up in Berlin. Uh, uh, that may be sufficient to, uh, to defuse the situation or at least lead to a process that defuses the situation. So what's on the table? In the Normandy group, primarily it's the Minsk protocols that are on the table. That's, that's the judicial or juridical basis uh, for the Normandy group's deliberations. It really doesn't have much to say about NATO because NATO is a different alliance that's, that was not part of the Normandy group uh, uh, discussions. And anyway, if NATO is going to, to actually negotiate, then the NATO principles have to be involved, and they're not all involved in the Normandy group. So it can get to the issue of, of uh, Luhansk and, and uh, Donetsk uh, and the Ukrainian autonomy of, or possible autonomy that could be worked out. That it can address, but it can't address the NATO issue. Even so, it's awfully important. Now, the second development that has begun to emerge and there's been th the release of, of some letters that purport to be uh, what the U.S. has proposed to the Russians, opens the door to some measures that could be worked out uh, in Eastern Europe, not in Ukraine, but in Eastern Europe, to try and lower the profile of, of conflict. Uh, among those things are, are suggestions that uh, maybe uh, the Russians could come and inspect uh, the missile, the, the air defense missile systems that are in Eastern Europe, and maybe uh, some of the NATO members, particularly Poland, could go and inspect uh, some that are on Russian territory close to Poland, especially Kaliningrad, which is a salient that puts its nose out into the Baltic. Uh, and which concerns the Poles a great deal because it's very heavily reinforced with, with uh, missiles and with air defenses as well. Uh, there's a, a launching system, I want to give you the right number if I can, called the MK-41. Now the MK-41 is a vertical launcher, a uh, standard one, that it can be used for air defense missiles. But the Russians say, it takes no effort, whatever, to load it up with Tomahawk missiles because they fit right in it. And, and these MK-41s are in, uh, in Poland and in other Eastern European locations. So the Russians say that's a concern to them 
because that's an aggressive uh, weapon. And while Tomahawk is a conventional system today, it started out as a nuclear system, but it's now supposedly conventional, the Russians don't necessarily believe that. So that that's a, a one of the issues. There's a lack of clarity, actually, in understanding both the Russian point of view and the U.S. point of view and the NATO point of view on this because it isn't clear what things have to be changed that would stabilize and, uh, uh, and make Eastern Europe potentially more peaceful. What about the Russian army? Where does it sit in relationship to Poland or to uh, Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia uh, or any of the others? Uh, what about NATO forces? The Russians say they got to go. They can't be on the edge. They have to move back. Uh, how can that be done? And why are you worried about 5,000 troops? It's, it's a reasonable uh, question to ask. So all of this is, is just sitting there unresolved, unresolved at this point. The Russians keep saying they're interested in those kinds of measures, kinds of deconfliction de measures that could be put in place. They're willing to talk about it, but they haven't really, it hasn't really been a negotiation yet. Uh, there's been some letters. Uh, every time there's a letter, someone says it's no good and we don't agree with it. <laughs> that doesn't get us very far. Uh, and there's not a forum. As I said, there's a forum for, for the Luhansk and, uh, uh, and Donetsk issue through the through the uh, uh, Normandy group, that forum exists, but there's not a forum to handle the NATO and Russian army issues, the, the territorial issues. There's no platform for it yet. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, and I'll make a criticism of NATO, NATO hasn't opened itself up very well to that kind of process. It could, but the current NATO leader has been rather aggressive in his statements and, and hostile to, to Russia, uh, very hostile, I'd say, unnecessarily so. I think that we, we need to find out if it's possible to reach some kind of modus vivendi, some kind of agreement, some kind of, or at least a process that leads to agreements, that needs to be put in place. And, and I don't see that yet. So I think if, if, if our president, uh, President Biden, uh, and some of the European leaders, Mr. Macron especially, because he's taken some initiative in this, uh, and, and the German government, uh, if, if they could agree to set up a process through, let's call it a, a, a strategic process with Russia uh, to negotiate this on a serious basis with the real experts. I mean, you can't do this with some political leaders, you know, mouthing off. It, does, it doesn't work very well. There's so many missiles, there's so many armored personnel carriers, there's so many tanks, there's so many thises and thats, that you really have to sort it out. And no one's done that. Will the Russians be interested in that? They, they say they will. They claim they will. In fact, we're the ones that are not exactly interested in it, although according to the, the leaked letters that have now appeared in, in the Spanish press, uh, we're moving in that direction, but very slowly. And we're still conflating it with Ukraine. I think the, the important thing would be to try to separate those. Let, let the, the Normandy group deal with the Ukraine issue from a, a political point of view. Let's call it a political point of view. And let the NATO family deal with the Russian side uh, from a military, uh, strategic, and security point of view. And those security discussions are vastly important. Now, a lot of people have said, well, you know, NATO has said especially, we're not going to go back on our principle. We're going to expand as we like. And if somebody wants to join NATO and we think they're worthy, we're going to take them in, which means we're going to take in Ukraine. Um, but you, one thing that's forgotten in this part of the dialogue, and I'd like to just spend a moment to talk about it, is NATO requires the consensus of all its members to take any action. You cannot uh, get someone into NATO if one member objects. And it seems to me that one way to out of this morass is a letter from the German Chancellor to 
America's uh, counterparts uh, uh, in Russia that says, we guarantee we're not going to vote for the inclusion of Ukraine uh, in NATO, period. We guarantee it. We won't. If they won't, it won't happen. It's that simple. NATO can keep its principles. There's a great, great line by Groucho Marx that said, I have my principles. And if you don't like them, I have other principles. <laughs> uh, and maybe that's where we are. Uh, we, we, NATO can keep its principles, but I think the Russians are extraordinarily too nervous about NATO coming into Ukraine. And as I said earlier, I am far from sure that it's a good thing for the Ukraine because it will trigger off uh, probably f some fighting, some war, and, uh, and, and that's not something we don't want. Now, there's, there's one other thing from the Russian mind, as I understand it. From the Russian mind, the, the buildup of Ukrainian forces by the United States, by its NATO partners, including the UK, uh, which has just shipped a bunch of stuff in. We just shipped 500 tons of weapons into Ukraine. Uh, that buildup, the Russians see as a, an effort to, put, to strengthen the Ukrainian army so it can take back Luhansk and Donetsk. That's their view. In other words, the, the size of Luhansk and Donetsk is not very big. It's about 30,000 soldiers altogether. The Ukrainian army is much larger. Up to now, they haven't been able to break the impasse. But if it's built up and they're getting all these uh, high-end anti-tank weapons, uh, armored vehicles, uh, all kinds of stuff, if it's built up, maybe it could overcome, you know, relaunch war against Luhansk and Donetsk and win. And that's why I think the Russians see that. And that puts the Russians in a real tough spot from their point of view and from our point of view. I mean, it's absolutely intentional to put them in a tough spot. But is it wise? Now, they don't think it's wise because I think we should at least let the diplomatic process take place before we turn to anything else. And there's elements in, the, in Ukraine. It's not just, it's not, the, you know, the current Ukrainian government would be regarded, I think, on a political scale as reasonably a moderate government. But there's elements in the Ukrainian military uh, that aren't so moderate, that are very nationalistic, uh, some say even fascist. And, uh, you know, we don't want to see First of all, it would be a bloody war, but we don't want to see any war, and we certainly don't want to see a situation develop that spreads and becomes even a bigger conflict. So that's my sort of summary where we are, and it is just the two main points again. The Normandy process has some prospect to help resolve, the under the Minsk Accords, uh, the Luhansk and, and Donetsk situation. May or may not work, but it's there. And we're still missing a, a platform, a, a, a modus operandi, to have Russia and NATO, including the United States, figure out how to stabilize and lower the profile of conflict or potential conflict in Eastern Europe. We need, we need a platform. We don't have one right now. That's really necessary. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there, and maybe we can talk about it. Steve, why now? In other words, this is seen as a crisis that Putin manufactured. There, there is nothing imminent, either in a Ukrainian application for NATO membership or its consideration. Putin has undertaken this large military buildup, and he's, he, he's already enjoying, let us say, the political effects of having done so. Now, what would you say about his timing? And also maybe if you could add to that, the military consideration that you can only keep troops deployed in or near the field when you've brought them from as far away as Siberia for a certain period of time, because it's a huge logistical challenge. It is. 
and uh, those troops need something to do other than provide uh, <laughs> political leverage. Right. I think the timing of, the, of this relates very strongly to the buildup of Ukrainian forces by, the, by NATO and by the U.S. especially, from the Russian point of view. Again, you know, you have to look at it from their angle. Uh, I think, you know, remember, this is the second deployment. There was a big one. They, they, they were, there was a summit with uh, President Biden and Mr. Putin. The Russians stood down that deployment. And they waited for things to happen that didn't happen. Now, we don't really have as good a readout as we would like to have of what they talked about. But it was pretty clear that they talked about resolving, you know, both questions, both the question of uh, Luhansk and Donetsk and, you know, and Ukraine on the one side and the NATO question on the other. I think those were both discussed. The Russians had some expectations of progress. Nothing happened. There wasn't any progress. The working groups kind of went nowhere. Um, it deteriorated and the Russians then brought the troops back. Simple as that. Okay, so the timing was sort of, I mean, you have to go back to the original timing, I guess, to understand. I mean, I think Putin did put some cards on the table by deploying those troops in the first place. He tried to leverage the, uh, the U.S. They met, they had a summit, it was a, uh, allegedly a productive summit. Uh, they were happy with the results. The Russians were happy, the Americans were happy. And then there wasn't any follow-up, it, it kind of... Uh, descended into nothing. And I think then the Russians got angry, and they're angry about a lot of things, but that was one of them. And so they put troops back, and this time more, just to make a point. So I think that's the timing part. I mean, I can't explain it any more than that. There was it a gamble on the Russian part. Yeah, sure was. Was it wise? I wouldn't say so. I think it was the reverse, but they did it. So, but they also, took uh, Crimea. Was that wise? Uh, they could have probably tried to work out something on Crimea, but they didn't. They just grabbed it. So they can be very opportunistic, and then they complain that we don't follow the rules. So this is traditional behavior from Moscow. We're used to it. But, uh, you know, they also have certain legal arguments on their side that they throw up every now and then, particularly uh, deals that were made with the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, which they participated in, and, and, and those weren't very well kept, and they're complaining about that now. So I think why now is largely a, a result of those things that, that uh, have been boiling up on the Russian side. On a broader, more national basis, the Russians feel that the, we've given them the back of the hand that we haven't respected them. You know, we know this kind of language. Uh, we've seen it before. Uh, and, and, and they want to be taken seriously. So does Putin want to go to war? I don't think he does, because I, don't, I, I think there's two reasons why he wouldn't want to. One is there's no guarantee that it would be quick and that you know, it would resolve itself in, in a victory for Russia. There's no, no guarantee of that at all. Uh, and he knows that. And the second is, I don't think he wants to turn over uh, his foreign policy and national security portfolio to the military. The Russian military has not a real good reputation about how they conduct themselves. If you want evidence, take a look at Chechnya. I mean, that's the perfect case. I mean, they have bulldozers. Now, sometimes that's good. It was a great way to get rid of Hitler. And I applaud it. But uh, sometimes not good. And I don't think in any case that... that Putin, who's a very smart guy, I mean, no one would say he's not, that, that he would want to take a, that kind of risk, that he would want to, to uh, get into a war if he can avoid it. The question is, he's going to be pushed. You know, he's being pushed now. I'm sure he's hearing from, you know, I can't, you, you mentioned it, keeping those troops there in the winter. You know, it's, it's February. It's cold, very cold. It's not a pleasant place to be, uh, and it's costly. It's logistically difficult. It's it's also has home political effects. The Russian the Russian army 
is, is a kind of people's army, whether you believe it or not, in the sense that the public uh, has a great affection for its military. It doesn't at all like casualties. It gets very upset when there's casualties. Uh, remember when a bunch of uh, uh, Russians were killed in Syria, and, and, and it was a very negative event. When the Kursk submarine sank and they brought the bodies back, it was a terribly negative event in Moscow and in rest of, and the rest of Russia. Going back to the Afghan war, when the Russians were involved, the body bags that came back to Russia helped destroy the Soviet Union that much. That's how big it is. So while it's not exactly a ringing democracy, it's nothing of the sort, but political leaders in, in Russia, whether they're communists or not communists, have to pay attention to the public on these things. I think Putin understands that very, very well. Very, very well. And I think he's, you know, he's kind of put himself in a bad spot politically because, you know, how's he going to get out of this? Well, it's, as people have suggested in other uh, movements that Putin has made with the Russian military, whether it was in Georgia, uh, which, the, which they bungled at the first yeah, part, but then uh, got it right from their perspective. And then in uh, Crimea, though, through the little what's called the little green men, uh, <clears throat> particularly Crimea was very popular in Russia, um, the, and this nationalistic feeling in Russia uh, reinforces support for Putin. Now, how this current situation is playing out in that respect, I don't know. But you alluded to the fact that they there's a there's a widely shared sense of grievance. And this feeds into it, and therefore it would one would think it would reinforce support for Putin. Now, on, Stephen, another subject you... Before you go on, on okay, that, go ahead. I just yeah. push back, well, not push back, but just make a comment that, you know, we, we being the U.S. especially, but also NATO, I and mean, also the British, are screaming sanctions, 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 sanctions. Now, first of all, I have a lot of doubts about sanctions because the Russians have a lot of leverage over Europe, natural gas being one of the most important ones, but not the only one. But when you think about it, who suffers from sanctions? Russian people. So this threat of sanctions, I think, angers the Russian people. So I don't think it's productive. First of all, I'm not sure we would ever do it in any real way. And secondly, it doesn't work very well. And, and thirdly, you know, the, the mess of being dependent on, on Russian oil and gas is largely the fault of the Europeans. It's not anyone else's fault. I, I was in the Reagan administration in the 1980s when we fought what was called the, against what was called the Yamal pipeline, which was the first big pipeline to come from uh, the Yamal Peninsula and bring natural gas in large volume into Germany. And at that time, we warned, and we strongly warned, that you know if, if Germany became dependent on natural gas from Russia, it would put us at a really big risk in terms of how we could conduct security policy. Because we basically be under a hostage situation, if you want. Because especially in the winter when you need all that natural gas for heating homes, but you also need it to run the factories and the power plants. Uh, sadly to say, Europe has, the dependence has grown more since then, not less. And while we stopped the AMA pipeline for a few years, it finally was built anyway. Uh, and the technology transfers, which is how we were trying to stop it, were, were, were lifted. They were lifted. Uh, in the Clinton administration, and uh, well, you know our our allies uh, put themselves in a very weak position, and still a very weak position today. And now there's the Nord Stream two pipeline, which is not running yet, but it could be, uh, which will bring even more natural gas into uh, Europe from from Russia. So sanctions are going to make a mess 
from the point of view of the Europeans, but it also it angers the Russian people. I don't see how that is, a, is an answer to the problem. But what this points to, Steve, is something that you have written on uh, so well, and that is that uh, Russia has other uh, measures it can take uh, short of the military. And certainly the gas is, is one of those measures. I saw a statistic that Europe as a whole now receives 43% of its gas from Russia. Poland, 60%. And Germany, a higher than 43%, I'm sure. Yeah, and over 50. So, what, uh, I mean, Putin can simply, he probably not shut it off, but he could slow it down until there are shivers in every home in Germany. I'm sure that's why Germany is, let us say, the most reluctant, along with Hungary, a member of, of NATO to, to do anything serious here because they are so vulnerable. In regard, I mean, we're already in the situation you just described when the Reagan administration warned Europe, you know, this will make uh, your defense quite difficult. And it's almost right. semi comical to see Biden asking Gutter and, and other, you know, he's running around shopping for gas for the, for the Europeans and right. particularly the Germans who can't ever even receive it because they haven't really built new LNG, no LNG ports. ports. So this is um, we're 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 at the point that was predicted. Even and worse than that, I mean, the, 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 one of the things that would have relieved Southern Europe, Italy, Greece, uh, would have been a pipeline that would have gone from Israel, Cyprus into uh, to there, um, and the Biden administration opposes it. Now it, it's it's incredible to me, aside from cutting off the pipeline. For the United States now, they've cut off a pipeline to Southern Europe. I mean, it's it's inconsistent, it's incomprehensible, it's bad policy. Every uh, expert, and I'm not an oil and gas expert by any stretch of the imagination, although in the '80s I learned far more about it than I ever thought I would. Um, but but every expert that's talked about trying to substitute, there's there's two substitutes: LNG and coal. That's it. Uh, LNG. Is probably impossible to import enough LNG, even if we had it, which we don't. And coal, yes, you can do coal, but not every power plant can be converted to coal. So it has to be a, a, a power plant that's capable of being converted to coal, and that would take months to convert to coal. And and then the Europeans will have to explain to somebody, I'm not sure who that person is, maybe our president, that the climate accords won't allow that. Uh, which they are very strong advocates of. So it's, it gets to be, you, you wonder who makes policy and how they go about it, because it's it's really foolish. It's really uh, nonsensical. Well, it'd be nice if Germany didn't shut shut off their nuclear power plants. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but they're doing it anyway. Yeah. So they're going to become more dependent, both on coal and on natural gas, by the way. And they make no bones about that, because after all, nuclear is bad. Well, they say, well, I don't know if nuclear is bad. What's bad about it? It doesn't pollute. You know, it's very cheap to run it. But, you know, the only ones that have been sensible about nuclear is, is French. And they've done it for how long now? 50 years? Something like that. It's been a great success. Uh, and they're the least dependent on imports of natural gas for the same, for the same reason. Well, I don't think they burn any coal. Maybe they do, but I'm not sure. Uh, in any case, uh, let's face it, Europe is in trouble if they get to the point where the Russians really want to, you know, retaliate. And then they can do uh, uh, natural gas easily. The other thing they can do, and we're already seeing some signs of it, are cyber attacks. Let's, be, let's you know, we... We have been hit in this country in our critical infrastructure by cyber attacks against things like oil and gas pipelines, banking and finance, communications, transport. Just this week, Antwerp was hit by a very big cyber attack to its oil and gas terminals. So I, I think what we're seeing is that 
maybe uh, the Russians are probing a bit now to see whether by doing a few of these here and there, they can wake up their colleagues in Western Europe to the fact that they could suffer cyber attacks. Uh, ransomware, what ransomware is, is where they basically encrypt your entire computer network and will only decrypt if you pay the ransom. That's how it works. We have no practical way today to stop a ransomware attack. Nobody does. If somebody can penetrate your network, they can encrypt everything in a matter of minutes and basically tell you you have to pay $10 million in ransom or more. But uh, and we had that in, in the pipeline in New Jersey. But think about it. It was a colonial pipeline. But think about it for a minute. Suppose they don't give you the key. They just say, ransom. Ransom is when you surrender. <laughs> you tell your government to surrender, and then we'll talk to you. Um, so the Russians have a big threat out there. And they can get the help of the Chinese. They can get the help of the North Koreans, who, by the way, have become good hackers. And, uh, you know, that's another whole story. I mean, I, I have written a lot about it over the years because we're completely and utterly dependent on commercial computer equipment, much of which today is manufactured in China. It may have an American name on it. It may say Dell or it may say Google or something, but it's, but it's made in, uh, and if it says Lenovo, we know it's Chinese because they own it. But all this is Chinese stuff. They know exactly how it works. They have put bugs in some of it. Uh, but more than that, they can they have a very experienced hackers, and we've had a very difficult time trying to stop them on a normal basis, not in a war situation. But if there's a real conflict and they raise the, the balloon, I think we're going to see a lot of our services and our capabilities really compromised in Europe as well. Since you've mentioned China, let's talk about the larger strategic picture at a time when the United States, as almost everyone agrees, is facing its biggest security challenge from China. I think so. A vastly more wealthy country than, than Russia with a huge amount of technical sophistication and modern military forces that uh, are antagonizing Russia now simply sends Putin further into the arms of President Xi when now is exactly the time in which we should be trying to show Russia that its long-term interests are not in Asia but in Europe, uh, not with China but with a Europe that at least can accommodate its concerns. But, but um, I mean, that's been said before. Others say forget it. Yeah. Russia uh, will, will never come around to that point of view, but uh, w w it seems to be that what we're doing makes it impossible. Well, as you know, the, the Russians and the Chinese say they're more or less in alliance. There's no formal one, but they're trying to behave as if there was. Uh, the difficulty for the Russians in the big picture is geopolitically China is a bit of a problem for them, has always been, and and they worry about that a great deal. Um, on the other hand, though, China is a market for them. It's probably the most important market they have right now for their military uh, hardware. You know, uh, sadly, I guess I think we can say sadly, and I knew it even when I was still in the government in the '80s that Russia produces weapons doesn't produce much of anything else that anybody wants, especially. So from a market point of view, what they have to sell are air defense, like the S-400 system, uh, aircrafts like the Sukhoi 35, you know, and, 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 and these kind of jet engines, rocket engines, all kinds of things like that. Uh, that's their industry. Uh, well, who's going to buy it in any quantity? Right now, it's China. It's a big buyer. But the Chinese like to copy everything. So at some point, they're going to they're squeeze the Russians out 
I think that's coming. It's actually some signs of it already. One of the areas is uh, jet engines, which is something the Russians have been struggling a bit w with, although they're trying to solve the problem of the one of their engines, which is used in their new uh, Su-57 jet fighter. Uh, and, and, and that engine has not matured properly. So the Chinese decided to make their own. And they're pretty close to having that solved. So at that point, they'll stop buying Russian engines. And then they'll stop buying Russian aircraft. And then they'll stop buying other stuff from Russia. And I think at some stage, not in the very distant future, Russia's going to lose its arms business in China. Then you wonder, what do they get for their relationship with China? You know, what's a buy them? They're not going to get the money for the weapons. Who's going to buy the weapons? The Russians are starting to sell some of their weapons to the West. Turkey has bought the S-400. India is buying the S-400. The UAE and the Saudis have been talking under the table to the Russians about buying the S-400. Uh, the UAE has also said, oh, we're interested in that new jet that you're going to build. You know, uh, uh, maybe we could do it together. Uh, you're starting to see a shift in Russia's interests, let's call it that. It's practical as financial interests. Natural gas, oil is, of course, a big one. But manufacturing is also hugely important because they have to pay those people that they employ. And they can only absorb so much stuff in themselves. So, so they need to market, they need to sell. I think we're seeing a change. But it's going to take some years before it plays out. That's the way to get the Russians on the Western side. But certainly they're, 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 they're going to sell more energy to China, not less. So that's increasing. Yeah, they're selling effect. energy, but I think their preference would be to, to because you know, there's, a, there's a finite amount of energy that the Russians have. Uh, they have to be careful. And I think they know that. Uh, in the 80s, we thought they were going to run out altogether. And then they, you know, thanks to the West, which came in and helped restore their oil fields and, and, and help them develop the, the uh, gas resources in the Siberian area, they found they had much more. But I think there's a point you reach where, where you're going to run out again. So I don't think you'll live on that in the long term. They need to supply their industry. And, and, the, and the best way to do that, the most direct way to do that is to be able to sell what they make and what they make are weapons. Or make other stuff. You would wonder about that. I wonder about that, but they've never done it. What do they make? Caviar? I mean, you know. Grain. Uh, grain? No, they're, actually, they're the largest grain exporter in the world right yeah. now. But I think that doesn't, that doesn't take care of your industry. That, you know, it's farming. Well, so that suggests that there may be some developing grounds for rapprochement or uh, foresight on the Russian side that they don't want to totally alienate the West. Um, That's right. Look, they, they played it pretty cleverly in the Middle East, I think, up to a point. But they've trapped themselves into being a big supporter of Iran, which I think is, is negative to them for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, they want to run Syria. They don't want the Iranians to run it directly or through Hezbollah, which is their proxy. Uh, and it also cuts them out from being able to do deals with the Saudis and with the UAE and with others uh, where they'd like to have influence, and even Egypt, which just uh, is, is a good target for the Russians, has always been. And has, I think, going to be buying some of they that Russian military that, equipment. Yeah, but and also, just to reinforce your point, Steve, the, the Russians are doing joint naval exercises with the Iranian Navy and the Chinese Navy. Yes, they are. Uh, but I think that, again, that puts them on the wrong side of, the, of, of uh, where they need to be if they want to be able to have good relations with the other Gulf states and to be able to do business and, and into the broader Middle East. You know, they were able to work out pretty well practical deals with the Israelis, which is interesting, I think, very interesting. It doesn't always, not always smooth sailing, but they have worked out uh, some arrangements including the confliction of, you know, some of the Israeli operations, but also some technology exchanges, a lot of back and forth, a lot of process going on. 
you know, they have to, you know, Russia has a lot of internal problems. They're, they're, they're no good at capitalism. <laughs> they, they don't, they, they are very paranoid about Western investors, you know, people coming in from outside. They made a mess of it in the first round. Um, but, you know, maybe there's hope there. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, you have to get, it, it's like chasing rainbows a little bit. I mean, it's, it's a little hard to be sure where this is going to lead. But I think in the broader context, I think they're going to try, the Russians are certainly going to try to do more business with the West, and that's going to ameliorate their behavior, it has to, or they're not going to get the business with the West. It's that simple. In, in, back in the European situation, I'm going to quote you something you wrote. Uh, <laughs> that is always dangerous. Quote, as NATO has become wider, it has become shallower and less able to meet its own standards for the defense of its members. And a weak NATO may, in fact, be worse than no NATO at all." That's right. Unquote. I stand by that 100 percent. Right. And let's say um, consideration of Ukraine's membership, does, does that the, make NATO weaker? It would be fatal to NATO. Fatal. Fatal. Because, well, because it will split the Europeans. And, 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 and then you know, NATO will get frozen and won't be able to act. Uh, the Europeans have already been playing around with their own defense force separate from NATO. Uh, I think that'll get new impetus. But I think, I think NATO could go by the boards. And I don't think that's in our interest, by the way. But I think it's very risky to keep broadening it, as I said. Well, is NATO capable of acting now? It has 30 members. It's, it's uh, capable of doing what? Defending its members, which is the, the purpose for its existence. Not sure. I'm really not sure. I mean, what's defend me? If the Russians attacked uh, the Baltic states, just as an example, which has a very small military, very small. And we can put some troops and some equipment there and we get pushed out of the Baltics. Is that defending them? Well, it's only a trigger for a larger conflict. Right. Well, yeah. we don't want so, that either. I mean, but no one wants that. And, you know, it wouldn't go there because I think then the Europeans would gang up and say, hey, we don't want a war with any more, more war. Let's sue for peace. Let's make a deal. Okay, we lose the Baltics. Goodbye. Good luck. That's simple. Uh, well, it's not that simple, but it sounds simple. But, I mean, it, it's, it's a consequence of being relatively weak. And being, you know, it's proximity, you know, these are weak states. You have a big Russia there that's a strong state. We have not much we can do about it in any immediate way. Yeah, we'll fight a little bit and get pushed out. Those countries, governments will fall. They'll put in pro-Russian governments, okay? And then the Germans will say, wait a minute. That makes them closer to us. We don't want them that close. Let's let's sign a, a deal with the Russians, and and I think that's how it would go. I mean, that's the reality. In my recent reading on World War II, I came across an interesting uh, thing about Poland. As uh, before, they were invaded by Germany. Right. They had not fully mobilized, and I presume two reasons for that. One is it could have been seen as an antagonistic. Uh, act toward Germany. But the second reason, and perhaps the stronger one, is that, well, now we have the guarantee of Great Britain and France. Right. So Germany won't attack us and there's no need for us to fully mobilize. So they were weaker than they needed to be, even though they fought valiantly. Now, NATO, because of the U.S. guarantee in it, seems to have behaved in a somewhat similar fashion. Instead of meeting the defense commitments that they themselves have made, their militaries have shrunk. Big time. Big time. Yes. And the, the, the German military, even the British military, is at a point where, as you said, if Russia deploys, you know, 130, 40,000 troops, what could NATO do? in, in uh, a conventional respect in meeting that demand? How long would it take them to mobilize a, a land force or the troops to, to meet a challenge like that? Weeks, months? Many months. 
and if at all. So it's over. Yeah, it's yeah, if it's at all. I mean, I think, I think that that the Russians would probably want to take back in some form or another the Eastern European countries that left the Warsaw Pact and became independent. Well, well I, I think, think that's, that's what, what the, those countries are worried about. Of course they are. Yeah, they should be. And do you think that's actually a an objective of Russia? Some people say yes. I don't have a feeling for it, actually. I don't know. Um, I don't think the Russians really want to do that so much. I don't think that's their agenda. Um, I think the Russians would be satisfied. This is just me guessing, of course. Everyone's guessing. Uh, but I kind of watch Putin very carefully. I listen to everything he says. I don't necessarily believe everything he says, but I listen to what he says. And what I hear is that's not his goal. Now, maybe the Russian army's goal or the Russian military goal. It's not his goal. And one of the things we have to be really careful about is precipitating a situation where there's a change of leadership in Russia and we get a real nationalistic or even a military leader. Then we're in trouble. The world's in trouble. So, I mean, Putin is a very crafty fellow, but I think that that uh, I don't think it's his goal to take over Eastern Europe by any means. I, I think it's his goal to be recognized as a as a partner in Europe. Well, he I have I too read what Putin says in his seven thousand word essay on Ukraine's history and its association historical association right. with Russia, and that he has a uh, a dream of restoring. Rus, Greater Russia, but like you, I have not seen Eastern Europe included in that. No, so he's not Stalin. So he's not Stalin. He he doesn't have the the communist ideology of world conquest, but he does want to store Russia to to its greatness. And I have uh, provocatively suggested to others that uh, any czar or Secretary General of the Communist Party would behave very much the way Putin is behaving now if they didn't want their name mud in Russian history. Because mm -hmm. Russia considers itself uh, its own defense compromise. When I say with the loss of Ukraine, he Putin has made clear that he's perfectly fine having Ukraine as its own country, just as long as um, it's friendly toward Russia and doesn't allow this foreign military alliance that's right. into it. That's exactly what he said. So that is that is what he said. If you take him at his word, um, be, because uh, any Russian, if you pointed it out, it, if the the eastern border of NATO moves to the eastern border of Ukraine, then the, the, the distance to Moscow becomes less than 300 miles. That's right. And if you look at Russian history, Russians would worry about their defense in depth, which has provided the security of their country. Poland, obviously, and other countries are saying, well, if Ukraine comes back under Putin's influence, there goes our defense in depth. Partly. Partly. Yeah. So that, that, uh, that's part of- with Belarus as well. Uh, right. No. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. There's a yeah, but I mean it does complicate their life. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I, again, I don't think that's his goal, even in Ukraine. I mean, he hasn't said that. Um, and uh, you know, people say, "Well, he's going to take Kiev. Do what with it?" He was very happy when there was a pro-Russian government in Ukraine. Yeah, I but it's why uh, the British and I forget who else were predicting that it's, it, they're aiming at a regime change there or a, you know, a coup d'etat that would emplace a pro-Russian yeah, leader uh, or they're agitating and have their agents in Ukraine, which would be a obvious thing, uh, to, to create that kind of agitation. You know, one th on the other side of things, while we've talked about Russia's interests for a moment, one thing that is consistent in the behavior uh, of Russia and the Soviet Union before it is its principal objective 
was to create fissures in NATO and most of all, of course, to get the United States out. out because those countries rely principally on the United States for their security and they, as you have pointed out, aren't doing enough to provide for their own. Um, and it, these discussions, another little group, which I don't think you mentioned, Steve, is that the uh, Great Britain and Poland and Ukraine are forming another little yes, I group for consultation, yeah. and right. I don't know if it's negotiations. So there, there are all kinds of different negotiating groups. And of course, Viktor Orban was with Putin for a five-hour meeting in Moscow and has made clear that he's <coughs> excuse me, not in favor of this. Uh, you, you could look at this, these developing fissures within NATO, uh, the, the position of Germany, uh, and you, you see, well, in a way, Putin's already enjoying some of the political benefit of his creating this crisis uh, because it's displaying these differences within NATO and causing political troubles for it. Maybe. I mean, I, I'll, I'll take that point. I don't, you know, I don't know how you enjoy something like this, but, but uh, uh, again, I say we need a forum that would work on the security issues. Um, that has to be France and Germany and the U.S., less so the U.K. Uh, Mr. Uh, Boris uh, Johnson went to Ukraine yesterday for a few hours. For what reason? I you know, try to save his prime ministership, I suppose. Um, well, it would would you would you say that, for instance, Boris Johnson's trip there, um, the statements by our own Secretary of State Blinken, as well as President Biden, the statements of other Western leaders on the inviolability of Ukrainian sovereignty and that we're behind you 100 percent would instill in Ukraine a, a kind of re possible recklessness that they they can count That's right. on. Well, I think security guarantees, which actually aren't going to be provided because because there aren't any, there aren't any, and and no European and uh, wants to fight there, and neither does the United States. And President Biden has made clear that we won't fight Biden there. Biden said they won't. Oh. Uh, Boris Johnson has said they won't. The Germans said they won't. Uh, who's going to fight? So go at it, Ukrainians. Yeah, and of course they would they would lose. Well, I think the Russians would make sure they lose because right now, I mean, you know, one could see a scenario where where the Ukrainians uh, feel they have enough arms, enough capability that they can go take Luhansk and Donetsk, and they'll try. The Russians will have to respond. Wouldn't that be, yeah, be a little touchy? I mean, we haven't mentioned Turkey yet and the, the role they're playing, but of course, Ukraine has been buying drones from Turkey, and they employed one of those drones. I forget whether it was in Ludensk. Uh, it was the Nets, and they, they knocked out a, they knocked out a tank, uh, not a tank, artillery a battery, a yeah. yeah. And this alarmed Russia quite a bit. And they didn't do it again, because I think the they understood there might be blowback, real serious blowback. Um, but it, it did demonstrate a capability, at least, in the use of this kind of weapon, uh, which was so effective for Azerbaijan in the recent war with Armenia. It was. Uh, one has to admire the determination of Ukraine to, to arm itself militarily, that their civil defense groups, they're obviously a great deal of patriotism that has developed in that country. And one thing the Russians would have to take into account is that they really would fight. I think they would, and I think it would be bloody. Yeah. But as others pointed out, that's not what uh, Putin wants to do. And as you said, that would there would be some body bags from that. So it would be perhaps well, something I, more I think Putin partial. Will, will probably, if, that's, if that happens, the Minsk agreements are dead, for sure. The, the Normandy group is dead, for sure. And I think the Russians will then recognize Luhansk and Donetsk as countries. 
and they will provide whatever military support is necessary. Openly, not just under the, you know, not just crossing the highway at night, but openly, moving troops, you know, hardware, everything. And maybe even bringing in the Russian Air Force, which the Ukrainians can't deal with. And somehow people in Washington and have forgotten about the Russian Air Force, but it's a quite a good Air Force, quite capable. Uh, we just don't want that to happen. I think that, that scenario is a terrible scenario. Well, um, Putin can't afford to be seen uh, politically to back down after making this That's large right. visible investment. What, what could NATO or the United States give him that would uh, provide to him the excuse and to back down and the appearance of at least a partial victory. You mentioned Germany saying, well, we're, we're not going to let Ukraine into NATO, though politically I don't know whether uh, Germany would be capable of doing that. Is it something know, like right. that that would uh, walk this thing back and come Well, I down? think we have to stop supplying arms to Ukraine in the massive quantities that we're doing. If that's a signal to the Russians that, okay, we got you, we got it, we understand, we're going to try to sort this out. You know, the language we're using in this is absolutely, to my mind, the wrong language. We're going to put the worst sanctions you ever saw. We're going to personally sanction Putin. What kind of talk is that? I mean, what, what is he trying to achieve with that nonsense? I mean, that's not how you solve a problem. That's how you well, close a problem. There were also discussions about removing Russia for, uh, banks from the um, SWIFT system. Yeah, it's a banking system. The banking system. The, the and, Chinese already said, we'll fix it. Yeah. And we'll what? stop using the dollar. I mean, yeah. there, there's things that the Chinese can do to us that we wouldn't like. So, I mean, why do we want to provoke that kind of thing? The... This, this would be too much of an exaggeration in this situation, but it does provide a certain lesson about economic warfare. Uh, when Japan, of course, had a very aggressive war cabinet back in the 1930s and had attacked Manchuria and China, and the United States was uh, pro-Chinese and was trying to pressure Japan to, to get out of China. We were unwilling to undertake any military steps to achieve that political objective, but Roosevelt chose an embargo in oil and steel. That's correct. Japan knew it couldn't survive, or at, le at least it couldn't keep its, its burgeoning empire uh, without that oil, and they would either have to capitulate to the United States or find other sources of oil. And they chose the latter by going into Indonesia, but first by hitting the United States in, uh, Pearl, Harbor. in Pearl Harbor, thinking, uh, if we don't do this now, we'll be weaker later. Which was an incorrect decision. Well, but so, they, in other words, this what we, what the United States was unwilling to do militarily, it thought it could achieve uh, economically. And that... Got us into a war. It got us into a war. Now, I, this, this... Not that it wasn't going to happen anyway, but... Right. It, but the... We, we might have been readier. Well, we were an isolationist country. Yeah. We didn't want it. We weren't ready at all. So, but, but the... the Thinking that we can use economic measures to achieve political ends, where the Russians have shown their willingness to put military cards on the table and saying, this is a red line for us, this is a vital national security interest, and if you cross over, we will use our military assets. I don't think they could be clearer about no, that. No, that's absolutely clear. And we say, oh, if you do that, we're going to take these drastic economic measures against you, to which... Putin responded, if you do that, then we break relations. We will no longer have diplomatic relations with the United States. That's, then that's, it's over. Yeah, but then you're in a 
nascent state of war, no matter how you look. Well, that's that's my point. Are we are we trying to achieve? Why do we want to have a war like that? What's the answer war, to that war? question? Well, I don't think we should. <laughs> I mean, the answer is we shouldn't uh, want to have a war like that. We don't need it. And and anyway, who guarantees anything in Ukraine? Since when? What's, where's the piece of paper that says we guarantee anything? There's no such thing. We have no alliance with the Ukrainians. There's no nothing written. There's no defense agreement. There's nothing. I mean, these statements are reckless, I think. And, 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 and the Russians find them extraordinarily offensive to them. And they think, well, this is America. These Americans are going to come and get us. I mean, you have to, you, you know, you can see the mentality of it. Um, do I applaud what the Russians did? Absolutely not. Do I think this is the way you handle this kind of crisis? Absolutely not. We're handling it the wrong way. We're not facilitating solutions. We're facilitating standoff. And a standoff can't last forever. So if there was one message to, you know, if I could talk to the president, which I can't, I'd say, you know, wise up. You know, you're going, you, you, and, you and Blinken, have gone way off in the wrong direction. You've got to pull it back. You've got to pull it back because there's a, too much involved, and it, and you don't have any idea what the outcomes are. So, why the nonsense? Let's let's get on with trying to sort it through. I think the Russians will take half a loaf, well, maybe even less than half a loaf, but it's important that they they pre, we preserve their prestige. Uh, you can't, you know, humiliate the Russians. If you do, it won't happen. It won't work. No. Uh, it's important that we meet them somewhere on the security issues so that they can have some confidence that, that, that we're serious about that. We're not trying to clobber them on the head with a bat. Uh, and we have to recognize that Ukraine is in their, their backyard. Not our back. Well, I think uh, Putin was trying to get that message to the United States by saying he was going to deploy troops to Venezuela and to yeah, I, and Cuba and to Cuba. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the well, way that he was... tried to communicate that. But, yeah. Steve, I'm afraid we're out of time right now. I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Stephen Bryan from the Center for Security Policy, for discussing with us Russia and Ukraine. What's next? I want to invite our viewers to go to the Westminster Institute website, not only for the video of this talk, but to see uh, Dr. Bryan's earlier talk with the Westminster Institute, and also to see the other uh, lectures that have been given on Russia and Ukraine, on China, and on other uh, foreign policy and human rights issues. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Robert Riley.